Good afternoon to you all, or uh, good morning or good evening to those of you joining from other time zones. It's a real pleasure to be invited to present some of my work here as part of uh, Fabi's international seminar series. Today, I aim to present some real world examples of what we can learn from genomics. I have been fortunate to be actively involved over the last dozen years or so in the I5K global initiative to sequence thousands of arthropod genomes. The I5K is a broad and inclusive community aiming to bring together researchers who are using genomics to study arthropods of all kinds. So whether you know it or not, you are all members. If you've not done so already, I encourage you to join the I5K Arthropod Genomics Community Slack workspace via this bit.ly link at the bottom of the screen. The pilot project selected just 28 species to kickstart the initiative, many of which are species that directly impact plant health. The importance of generating such reference genomic resources for arthropods impacting plants has clearly been recognized, with many new projects adding to the accumulating data, some of which I will briefly mention today. While we are often uh, very focused on each of our own uh, particular study systems, it is important to recognize that every new genome adds to the detail of the overall understanding of arthropod biology and evolution. I'm not a particular specialist in any study system, perhaps uh, with the exception of mosquito immunity, but rather in applying comparative genomics approaches to try to make sense of all of these data. This has primarily been through my work on the OrthoDB catalog of orthologs, trying to keep up with scaling computational analysis to identify equivalent genes amongst hundreds of species. This we use to explore evolutionary histories of genes and gene families in terms of gains, losses, novelties, extinctions, and of course, to help infer putative gene functions in all these newly sequenced species. At the same time, we need to be confident of the quality of the resources that we are generating before we can use them in our comparative analyses. Hence, my work on the side on the completeness assessment in terms of expected gene content with the benchmarking universal single copy orthologs. So that was a bit of context, and now let's move on to some content. Before looking at some case studies, I should introduce you to some of the comparative genomics analyses that are key to understanding how genes and genomes evolve. Comparative genomics approaches allow us to quantify gene and gene family evolutionary dynamics to contrast conserved or stable versus divergent or dynamic arthropod genes. This can involve employing sequence-based metrics at protein and DNA levels, but also quantifying rates of gene and intron gains and losses across the phylogeny, as well as identifying stop codon read-through candidates and building phyletic profiles. Today, I will present a few examples, case studies if you like, of insights from genome sequencing and comparative analyses of arthropod species that impact plant health. Arthropods can, of course, play both positive and negative roles and certainly genomic sampling to date reflects this duality. I would like to briefly explore recent efforts in the genomics of uh, thrips, bugs, moths, probably will skip mites and uh, sawflies today just for the sake of time, and then go into a bit more detail on comparative evolutionary genomics studies of bumblebees and beetles. Reports of declines in abundance and distributions of many arthropods, particularly pollinators, point to several interconnected causes. These include habitat loss, pathogen transmission, climate change, and agrochemical or insecticide exposure. These are threatening pollination services to both wild plants and crops, raising concerns for many arthropods, the plant species they service, food security, and ecosystem stability and biodiversity more generally. These changes also add to the threats from pest species, especially the invasives, 
where traditional control measures are becoming less and less effective. To start with, I will focus on a worldwide pest species, for which uh, the paper just came out in BMC Biology last week. This is our genome sequencing and analysis of the Western flower thrips, the first genomic resources for the order Thysanoptera. As many of you will no doubt know, these thrips are an invasive species with a global distribution that cause substantial damage to crops and ornamental plants, particularly in greenhouses. They are also interesting to study because of their so-called neometabolist development that seems to be somewhere between what we traditionally think of as holo and hemimetabolist development. Despite being a relatively small genome, it was difficult to produce a highly contiguous assembly. One reason possibly being the very high GC content of about 50%. Nevertheless, Busco analysis indicated very good completeness in terms of expected gene content, meaning that we could proceed with our detailed comparative analyses, mainly of genes and gene families related to chemosensation, detoxification, immunity, and development. For this study, we were fortunate to have a large collection of transcriptomic samples, one set being from the salivary glands. This allowed us to build the first catalogue of Thrips salivary gland genes, which is of course vital to begin to understand how these insects interact with and possibly manipulate their plant hosts. As expected for salivary gland products, very few had identifiable orthologs in other species being mostly rapidly evolving and thrips specific. We also produced transcriptomes for several developmental stages, which allowed us to perform gene co-expression analyses to identify two to 3,000 genes in 35 different modules that were associated with these key morphological transitions. Genes from key development pathways were identified, as well as other genes, particularly transcription factors, which together must coordinate neometabolist development. Importantly, a better understanding of the genetics of their development will inform control strategies in these and other thrips species. From Thysanoptera now to Hemiptera. The brown marmorated stink bug is also highly invasive, and I can personally vouch for this as I kill about half a dozen every day on my balcony as they attempt to come inside for the winter. The milkweed bug is not considered a pest, but it has served as an important genetic model, particularly in understanding development processes in non holometabolous insects. While uh, Oncopeltis is a specialist seed feeder, Heliomorpha shows extremely high levels of polyphagy, one of the reasons it is such a successful invasive pest. These and other sequenced hemipterans, including uh, blood feeders and sap suckers, offer now opportunities to study remarkably different feeding ecologies with important repercussions for both agriculture and human health. These bug genomes are much larger than the thrips, clocking in at around one gigabase pairs. Given the technologies we were using at the time, this proved rather challenging. So these drafts remain somewhat, somewhat fragmented. And we are continuing now using high C scaffolding technologies to try to improve these assemblies. The annotations of 20 to 25,000 protein coding genes nevertheless recovered almost all evolutionarily expected genes from Busco. Orthology analysis across sequence species identified a conserved core of about 5,000 hemipteran wide orthologous groups. Investigating gene families of interest identified many putative insecticide resistance genes with different capacities in different species. And examining immune gene repertoires showed variable presence of complete IMD pathways, possibly linked with uh, the obligate endosymbionts that these species host. The stink bug genome encodes many gustatory receptors, possibly contributing to its generalist feeding behaviors and comparisons of metabolic capacities also showed key differences linked to the types of food each bug prefers. 
now from Hemiptera to the Lepidoptera. Not so much a pest as one of the best insect models, certainly for biochemistry research, enabled mainly because of the huge size of the caterpillars for easily extracting hemolymph. The 420 megabase pair genome was produced um, by no means to chromosomal scale, but still showed good completeness in terms of gene content, as any good draft genome assembly should. Importantly, this project really brought together a lot of researchers working on different aspects of Manduka biology, resulting in the manual curation of almost 2,500 annotated genes. This really allowed for the detailed examination of many different biological pathways and processes, one being the immune system, where we have learned a lot from Manduka over the years, especially with respect to recognition and effector processes that occur mainly in the hemolymph. Just imagine how many flies you would need to get to even close to the amount of hemolymph that you can get from one of these larvae. From a genome architecture evolution perspective, finally having half a dozen or so lepidopteran genomes meant that we could, for the first time, look in detail at how genome arrangements are conserved, and much more so in lepidoptera than other insect orders examined to date possibly linked to their holocentric chromosomes. Now I would like to switch to the Hymenoptera. Here, uh, looking at our recently published work on bumblebee diversity. The genus Bombus comprises more than 250 extant species that are classified into 15 subgenera. And they display remarkable diversity in morphology, color patterning, food preference, pathogen incidence, and they exhibit diverse life histories and ecologies. Analyzing the conservation status data of more than 100 bumblebee species showed that about a third of them are in decline. Susceptible species are not randomly distributed across the species phylogeny, possibly driven by key ecological and behavioral traits. However, our genomic sampling of this diversity has remained limited to genome resources for just two main commercially used species, Bombus terrestris and Bombus impassions. To broadly sample the genomic and phenotypic diversity of bumblebees, we selected 17 representative species for whole genome sequencing based on their phylogeny, ecology, behavior, geography, and of course, uh, specimen availability, making now a grand total of 19 bumblebee genomes shown here with uh, representative outgroup honey bee species. These include several high altitude species, as well as the cuckoo bumblebees that do not have worker castes and instead feed on food collected by workers of their host species. Now with species from each of the 15 Bombus subgenera, we have dramatically extended sampling beyond just terrestrial and impassions. A few stats just to start with to convince you that we really have built good quality genomic resources for these bumblebees. The genomes are relatively small with the advantage of being able to use a single haploid drone per species to generate the fra fragment libraries. We were able to obtain scaffold N50s of between two and seven megabases using Discover de novo and BEST. With repeat content analyses showing variations of between 8 and 18% uh, repetitive DNA. The assemblies were also uh, remarkably complete in terms of expected gene content, averaging at 99% uh, complete Busco recovery. And our annotation pipeline produced between 14,000 and 17,000 protein coding genes per assembly. Finally, for five species where we were able to use high c data with the 3D DNA pipeline, we were able to build chromosomal level genome assemblies. Using the concatenated alignments of about 3000 single copy orthologs, including outgroup Apis species uh, not shown here on the phylogeny, uh, the maximum likelihood species phylogeny shows all nodes but one with 100% bootstrap support. This confidently places the subgenus represented by Superbus and Waltoni as sister group to all other Bombus subgenera. 
it also confirms that the cuckoo bumblebees, despite their very different behavior and ecology, do not form an independent genus. The well-supported IQ tree phylogeny, however, hides extreme levels of discordance from individual gene trees, where, on average, nodes in the phylogeny are supported by only two-fifths of the gene trees, and only half of all informative sites in the alignments. These site concordance factors and short internal branches are consistent with incomplete lineage sorting driving the gene discordance rather than introgression. One of the reasons for proposing a distinct genus for the cuckoo bumblebees was their karyotype of 25 chromosomes compared with the presumably ancestral 18 chromosomes found in all other species examined to date. The high C assemblies help to explain how this increase came about. Rearrangements highlight cases of strongly maintained chromosomes, such as number five, uh, shown here in blue, as well as uh, clean and tidy splits, uh, such as chromosome 11, giving rise to 11 and 25 in the social parasite, shown in red, and more complex cases of, for example, in yellow, parts of chromosome 7, 8 and 10 and 16 uniting to form chromosome 22. Looking first at uh, chemosensation, the olfactory receptors consistently showed some of the highest levels of sequence divergence and or relaxed constraint amongst all functional categories. Phyletic profiles also showed both olfactory and gustatory receptors to be highly lineage specific and copy number variable. While the chemosensory gene repertoire sizes are nowhere near as large as say ants, this variation could reflect different feeding preferences or foraging strategies in these different bumblebee species. Two potentially very interesting loss events amongst olfactory receptors include for species inhabiting uh, high altitude plateaus where there is low floral abundance diversity and for the cuckoo bumblebees that rely instead on their hosts to do the foraging. Analyses of the very first two bumblebee genomes of impassions and terrestrials revealed a much smaller immune gene repertoire than in well-studied dipterans. This paucity extends now to all examined bombus species, which include all the key components, but exhibit very few gene family expansions. For example, all species have just two gram-negative binding proteins, and there are between four and six peptidoglycan recognition proteins. Despite this reduced repertoire, analyses of sequence constraint showed patterns that are consistent with previous studies in other insect groups, where the signaling and recognition proteins are amongst the most divergent. Additionally, uh, branch site tests highlighted distinct immune system components with evidence for positive selection in different bumblebee lineages, possibly an indication of their variable pathogen exposure histories and today's capacity to actually defend themselves. For further details and additional results, I invite you to check out the paper, which was uh, published recently at MBE. In summary for bumblebees for today, we believe that these genomic resources will help to better understand and monitor bumblebee species health, as well as local and global diversity. Our evolutionary analyses span the entire genus and provide a balanced overview of genomic and genetic variation in bumblebees. We can also begin to link this variation to their remarkable diversity in morphology, color patterning, food preference, pathogen incidence, and other diverse life history traits. Importantly, because uh, these resources offer a foundation for building on research on the use of bumblebees in agriculture, and of course, to ensure the long-term future of these important pollinators. And finally today, I would like to switch to looking at uh, Coleoptera and asking the question about how the uh, interactions with uh, plants in the form of feeding on plants may have uh, influenced beetle species diversity. Here, the overarching question we set out to address 
has fascinated evolutionary biologists and particularly entomologists for many, many years. Can the incredible that species diversity found amongst beetles today be explained by coevolution with the many plants on which they feed? And more specifically, with modern sequencing technologies allowing us to sample large scale genomic data from many species, can we now find support for this hypothesis in the way that beetle genes and genomes have evolved? This hypothesis is logically appealing because plants offer an abundant and varied food source, but they also defend themselves against plant eating insects. The beetles feed on various plant materials, often causing great damage. Indeed, some of our worst agricultural pests are beetles. But the plants fight back by producing distasteful deterrents and toxic poisons. In turn, beetles must continuously find the means to counteract these defenses, thereby propelling an endless arms race. Beetle responses to plant defenses are numerous, of course, and aim to neutralize or minimize their effects either directly or indirectly. Direct neutralizing is carried out by various families of detoxification enzymes, including cytochrome P450s, carboxylesterases, and glutathione S transferases. In an arms race scenario, one hypothesis would be that to more effectively deal with harmful toxins, plant feeding beetle species will produce many more of these enzymes than other beetles that rely on other food sources. It follows, therefore, that one possible mechanism to achieve this would be to have many more copies in their genomes of the genes encoding these enzymes. To test this, we obviously first need to collect the relevant genomic data, that is, sequenced, assembled, and annotated transcriptomes and genomes of different beetle species. We sampled nine species from the mainly uh, predatory suborder of beetles with transcriptomes, and nine species from the mostly plant feeding suborder of beetles with both genomes and transcriptomes. Importantly, reaching this sample size of a total of 18 beetle species was made possible only through the generous sharing of pre-publication data from the I5K 5000 Arthropod Genomes Initiative and the One Kite 1000 Insect Transcriptome Evolution Consortium. As with any scientific study, it is important to first assess the quality of the input data. In our case, we were particularly interested in examining gene copy number variation amongst our set of 18 beetles. So for these to be valid, for the comparisons to be valid, our gene sets need to be mostly complete. That is, our genomes and transcriptomes need to have captured as complete a catalog of genes in each species as possible. Most of our data sets showed good completeness levels, allowing us to proceed with our analyses and to perform additional control analyses where we could exclude some species with uh, uh, slightly lower completeness levels. Next, we need to delineate gene families or groups of orthologs, orthologous genes across our set of beetle species. These orthologous groups allow us to trace gene evolutionary histories and thereby examine changes in gene copy number throughout the evolution of these species. To delineate orthologous groups, we use the OrthoDB catalog of orthologs, using both already clustered species and mapping of our transcriptomes to orthologous groups at OrthoDB. Now, to model gene copy number changes, we first require a robust species phylogeny that defines the evolutionary relationships amongst our beetles. The phylogeny of predatory and herbivorous beetles, rooted with an outgroup species, provides the evolutionary framework for analyzing traits such as gene copy number variation. To achieve this, we selected universal single copy orthologs from our OrthoDB delineated orthologous groups, aligned these with MAFT, concatenated them into a super alignment, and then used this to reconstruct the species tree with RAXML. Now with all the necessary input data assembled, we can infer gene gain and loss events along the species phylogeny. To do this, we employed the Computational Analysis of Gene Family Evolution, or CAFE, inference tool. K 
CAFE uses a birth and death process to analyze changes in gene family sizes, while accounting for phylogenetic history, as well as for pot potential errors or missing information in the input data, providing a statistical foundation for evolutionary inferences of gene family expansions or contractions. This allowed us to compare the rates of gene gain and loss per gene per million years, as well as the numbers of orthologous groups affected by such gene gain or loss events between the herbivorous and the predatory beetle lineages. Our comparisons showed that gene family evolution in terms of copy number variations was much more dynamic amongst the herbivores than the predators. We examined only beetle-wide orthologous groups to avoid potential biases that could be introduced by including orthologous groups specific to one lineage or the other. In a nutshell, considering all genes from such beetle-wide orthologous groups, the plant, feed, the plant feeding lineage showed a much higher gain rate across more orthologous groups, as well as a lower loss rate spread out over more orthologous groups. Now it is possible that this greater dynamism may be generally linked to the greater species richness of polyphaga, with no specific role for plant feeding in underpinning this trend. However, among the candidate orthologous groups for detoxification, there are also more gains in plant feeders, and in contrast to the background orthologous groups, there are fewer orthologous groups showing losses. Thus, both gain and maintenance are higher for detox gene families in the plant feeders, which is consistent with a role, with a key role for plant defenses in driving dynamic gene repertoire evolution, in particular these lineage-specific expansions. Such gene family, uh, gene repertoire changes may be significantly different between the two lineages, but are the lineage-specific expansions in plant feeders actually adaptive? To address this question, we tested for signatures of adaptive expansion in each suborder by comparing neutral Brownian motion to adaptive ornstein uhlenbeck evolutionary models. The models consider per-species gene count as a trait that can evolve towards a value, which may or may not differ between the two suborders and may or may not be driven by selective pressure. This we call the optimum value in the models that evoke selection. Amongst all orthologous groups with significant variations in their gene content, the vast majority showed significantly higher optima for the plant feeding lineage, that is, polyphaga showed more adaptive lineage specific expansions. In addition, these adaptive expansions were enriched for our candidate gene families involved in detoxification processes. A striking example of adaptive lineage specific expansions is that of a group of glutathione S transferases. Genes from plant eating species are shown in red, and in total, they outnumber uh, genes from predatory species almost two to one with an ornstein uhlenbeck optimum of 12 compared to just uh, seven. The red and yellow bands highlight phylogenetically well-supported lineage and species-specific expansions, respectively. This group of genes was identified first as dynamically evolving from our CAFE analysis, and then as adaptive from the OE analysis, with the best-fitting evolutionary model having two distinct optima. These adaptive lineage-specific expansions support beetle-plant coevolution with genomic signatures accompanying this dietary shift to plant eating. Taken together, our results provide genomic support for the popular hypothesis that Coleoptera species richness may be in part explained by their interactions with land plants. Specifically, we found candidate detoxification genes were often part of the most dynamically evolving gene families as quantified by our CAFE analyses. Furthermore, our evolutionary modeling with OE supported adaptive rather than neutral expansions of such families. Confirmation and generalization of our observed trends 
would ideally involve whole genome sequencing to assemble and annotate high quality genomes for an improved resolution and confidence, as well as sampling from other beetle clades or some of the many other groups of insects with dietary shifts towards plant feeding to enable phylogenetic replication of these results. Nevertheless, performing multi-species analyses with rigorous statistics and evolutionary modeling using both genomic and transcriptomic data, we were able to identify evidence of adaptive selection on gene copy number beyond just anecdotal observations of variable gene counts in different species. So that was somewhat of a whirlwind tour through several arthropod genomics projects, but I hope you got a flavor of the types of questions we are asking and how the genomic data are beginning to help better understand arthropod biology and of course their interactions with plants. Hopefully now there'll be time to take some of your questions. Thank you.